All right, good morning, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I am George Geis, and welcome. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, I am going to talk today about a topic that many of you have probably never really heard of or never really thought of. Uh, it's called the law of agency. And it's it's a fundamental topic to business law, but it's not a very well-known area of, of, of the law. If you're like me, uh, when I was getting ready for law school, uh, I did a fair amount of research on the internet or uh, you know, picked up a couple of uh, books on the topic of how to, how to do well in law school and how to succeed during your first year. And you know, they all have names like um, Law School Confidential or Slaying the Law School Dragon or One L of a Ride, something like that. And they do, I think, a pretty good job of talking you through the basics of what it's like to, to be a first year student. And they'll tell you a little bit about contract law and criminal law, but they won't say much about agency law. It's not a topic that generally gets much attention, but nevertheless, it is a fundamental area of the law. It's usually the very first thing that you'll study whenever you're um, um, getting into business law. And uh, it used to be actually required 1L class. So what is it? What is agency law? Well. You've probably heard of a movie agent or a sports agent, but the truth of the matter is that anyone can have an agent. In fact, I bet some of you might have an agent right now, perhaps without even realizing it. And you might say, well, Professor Guy, so what? Who cares? Well, you should care uh, in part because agency law says that under certain circumstances, you may be responsible legally for the acts of somebody else. I'll say that again, under certain circumstances, you may be responsibly legally for the acts of somebody else. And you say, well, hold on, I can barely be responsible for my own acts. And now you're telling me I'm going to be responsible for what other people do. And the answer is yes, maybe. And then you say, well, professor guys, how do I know whether I have one of these agency relationship things? And the answer is that agency is a um, special relationship in the law that arises from three major requirements. You can have an agency relationship when there's an agreement between the principal and the agent that the agent shall act on behalf of the principal and be subject to his or her control. And when you have those three requirements, an agreement acting on behalf of and subject to his or her control, then you've got an agency relationship. So you may say, hey, Professor Geis, Here's $5, can you go give me a cup of coffee at the law school coffee shop? And if I say yes, we might be in an agency relationship. I've now become your agent. And depending on some additional circumstances, you may or may not be responsible for things that I do while I'm getting you that cup of coffee. Okay, well, why is this important for corporate law? Well, if you think about it, corporations can only act through their agents. You know, some people will say things like corporations are people, too. And I'm not sure I really know what that means. Corporations are treated as separate legal entities, often in the eyes of the law. But as a matter of um, reality, corporations can only act through other people. They can act through their own agents. And so, you know, if you have a company like Facebook, for example, the only way that Facebook can really do anything is if Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg or one of the other agents of Facebook does something on that corporation's behalf. So that's why um, that's why agency law is usually one of the very first things that you'll study um, um, when you're getting into a, a class on, on corporations. OK, armed with this knowledge, I now want to put you in the position of judge and jury and ask you to help me decide a few cases. You have all the law right now that you need to know. And while I've handed out uh, a one written opinion earlier, I actually want to start with a slightly different case. We'll get to the um, um, our uh, Ira Bushy case in a little bit. But I want to start with another case. And this one's known as uh, Gorton v. Doty. So let me tell you a little bit about the facts of Gorton v. Doty. And then I'll invite you to, to, to pop into the class if you like. And you can um, um, give us your thoughts on how this case should be resolved. So the case involved a, um, a teacher in Idaho. Her name was uh, Miss Doty, and one day Miss Doty was uh, hanging around in the faculty, uh, you know, lounge, getting a cup of coffee, uh, when the coach for the football team walked in, and uh, Miss Doty asked the coach, his name was Coach Garst, Coach Garst, 
do you have all the cars you need to get the players over to the football game this Friday night? I guess they didn't take a bus at that moment in time. They would all sort of drive together in cars over to the away games. And the coach said, no, actually, we could use one more car. We're a little bit short on having enough transportation to get all the players down to the game. And Ms. Doty said, OK, I tell you what, I'll let you use my car to take some players to the game. But I don't want a teenager to drive it. So I'll only give you my car and let you use it if you're the one that drives the car. And the coach says, OK, great. Thank you. I will do it. Took the car, went to the game. We don't know if they won or lost the football game. Uh, but on the way home, uh, the coach was driving her car and he got into an automobile accident. And one of the football players, Gorton, was injured in the accident. And let's just assume, for the purposes of this case, that the coach was driving negligently. The coach committed a legal wrong by not driving appropriately. Maybe he was so upset by the loss or so you know, excited by the win that um, you know, he wasn't being careful in the way that he drove. Um, and um, got into the accident and Gorton was injured. Now, put your uh, plaintiff's lawyer's hats on for a minute and think about under circumstances like this, um, who might you try to sue if you're Gorton or if you're Gorton's family? You've had some medical bills. You don't want to pay for those medical bills yourself. You've you know, been wronged. Um, many of us, I think, would start by considering the possibility of suing the coach. Coach was the one perhaps that drove negligently. Let's try to, to, to go after the coach. The problem was that this was a pretty significant accident and um, the coach was killed. And uh, apparently the coach and the coach's estate didn't have funds to cover the medical bills. So another possible defendant might be uh, the school. The school, after all, was you know involved in some level in sponsoring this game or sponsoring the event. Uh, but there was a strange uh, rule in place under the under the time of the case that uh, prevented the school from being a defendant, some sort of an immunity statute that that's rare these days. So instead, Gordon decided that Gordon was going to try to sue Miss Doty. Gordon was going to um, try to go after Miss Doty and recover from Miss Doty from um, for, for, for the for the medical harms. And the um, case really turned on the outcome of whether Miss Doty was viewed as a principal and Coach Garst was viewed as an agent of Miss Doty. So here again are the elements. There has to be an agreement that um, the agent is going to act on behalf of and be subject to the control of the principal. And if so, you've got an agency relationship. And if so, then perhaps Miss Doty would be responsible for the wrongs uh, of, of Coach Garst. So I want to invite any of you um, that want to comment on this case. I mean, the question, right, is, is this an agency relationship? If you're interested or if you have thoughts, go ahead and please share your screen. Um, you can also comment on the chat if you have any thoughts as well. But um, I'd like to you know, invite a couple of you to share your thoughts. Do you think that Ms. Doty should be liable for Coach Garst's negligent driving? Any thoughts um, from, from those of you in the class? All right, we have someone I think who's popping in. Let me see if I can share his screen. William, welcome. Thank you. What um, do you think? To answer your question, I'd say yes. Okay. It has all the markings. It has all the markings of an agency relationship. Since number one, there was an agreement. He agreed to drive her car. He specifically agreed that there would be no 17 year olds driving her car so that's also a, a kind of a sub agreement beneath that he's acting on her behalf and he did follow what she said okay so i would say it is all so clearly there was an agreement right there was some type of an agreement um do you think that there is enough evidence that the coach was acting subject to her control or how would we know that he was acting subject to her control? Well, I think just the very act of driving the car would be subject to her control. Okay. Just since it is, could be considered a deadly weapon. And at the same time, can, I think it makes it slightly easier considering that he followed what she asked him to do. Um, he wasn't in the passenger seat you know, drinking a beer. 
far as we know. She, she conditioned the use of the car on his willingness to follow her direction that he be the one who drives. So, you know, it wasn't as if she told him exactly what route to go, but she clearly did put a condition on his use of the car. And that might indicate that there was some type of control that she had. Now, let me ask you um, about this other element, acting on behalf of. Was the coach acting on her behalf? I mean, essentially, I would say since she could have, given the fact that there was this agreement, she just as easily could have been the one driving. And she could just as easily have been the one in the accident, and then she would have been just as liable. Okay. Um, so maybe by virtue of the fact that she didn't have to drive the car, we should understand that he was acting on her behalf or he was conveying some sort of a benefit for her. Um, let me mm -hmm. see if there's any other thoughts. Anyone else want to uh, jump in? Go ahead and share your audio and video if you have other thoughts on the case and whether this should give rise to an agency relationship. No one else has jumped in, so don't 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 be shy. Um, but the court actually, okay, here we do have somebody coming in. Benjamin, I think. Hi. Benjamin, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, I say that she that he's not her agent because uh, you see, she she gave him a car for his use. Like you see, you know, he she supplied him with a car. She didn't look to hire him for a job. He if he you know, if she didn't give him a car, he would go and get get from someone else. So he was okay. sort of. He was a principal looking for a tool to do a job, not she was looking to hire someone to do a job she couldn't do herself. Okay. Do, do you feel like she got a benefit or there was some reason why we should understand the coach is acting on her behalf? Um, I think she got the benefit of her being a good citizen or being a helpful colleague. Okay. Um, but she wasn't looking to hire a driver for the team. He was looking to hire a driver for the team. Yeah, it seems like if anything, it might be flipped where yeah. he was the one that was receiving a benefit because he got to be able to use the car to get the football players down to the game. Now, um, in the end, the court actually agreed with William and it said, yes, I do think that there is an agency relationship here. The case was a little bit puzzling, I think, for the for the reason I just said. It's not 100 percent clear that she was the one that was you know, getting the benefit or that he was acting on her behalf, maybe there's some sort of a school spirit benefit that she was doing by helping out the school. But um, I think the case was um, viewed as a little bit of a puzzle. Nevertheless, I'm going to excuse you guys for the moment. Um, nevertheless, I think it was a situation where um, we can see just how important this agency relationship status can be because, you know, I don't think she would have expected that she would be responsible for his negligent driving. Um, but nevertheless, the court said there is an agency relationship and therefore we are going to hold her responsible. All right, let's try, um, let's try a couple of more hypotheticals. And I want to um, invite um, all of you who are, um, who are here. Uh, I see there's about 23 or 24 folks. So all of you that are here, um, I'd like to invite you to participate. No need to pop in, but if you have access to the chat, uh, I'm going to ask for um, just a yes or no reply in, in the chat, and you can tell us what you think about this hypothetical. So let's imagine that um, I come up to you and I say, um, how are you doing? Here's my pen. And you take my pen. Have you become my agent? Tell me what you think in the chat. Yes or no. Have you become my agent? I'm seeing a lot of no's, a lot of no's. Yeah, those of you saying no, um, you're, you're right. Yeah, you, we don't have the elements. Um, all I've done is give you my pen. You know, I haven't asked you to do anything with it. I haven't, you know, created anything else. Um, we are in probably what would be understood as a donor donee relationship. And, you know, we'd maybe want to know a little bit more about whether you get to keep it or whether you got to give it back to me. But it's not enough that we're going to meet the three elements ne necessary for an agency relationship. Let's try once more. Here's my pen. Can you sell it for me? And you say, sure, I'll do it. Are we in an agency relationship? Tell us what you think, yes or no. All right, lots of yeses are coming through, a few noes. Um, probably the answer is yes, but it might depend on whether or not I've got enough control over the situation. 
Uh, I'm generally telling you what to do, sell my pen for me. So probably that's enough control to give rise to an agency relationship. Um, but we might wanna know a little bit more about that control element in order to really figure this one out. Okay, last one. You buy my pen for fair value and you're looking to say $5 or whatever it's worth. And you're looking to resell it. You're, you're in the business of uh, pen resale, uh, uh, a profiteering, and you're gonna try to buy my pen for $5 and then resell it yourself for a profit. Are you my agent? Yes or no? Yeah, most of you are saying no. We're not in an agency relationship, right? You're not doing anything for my benefit. We are in a distribution relationship or a contractual relationship. Um, we've made a contract and you've now bought my pen. And if you can get more for it, great for you. If you can't get more for it, too bad for you. But you're not acting on my behalf. You're not doing anything uh, necessarily for me. Okay, great. Thanks for your engagement. Um, let's step back a little bit and talk uh, more generally about this overall view of um, overall area of agency law. We've been talking so far about the creation of an agency relationship and how you know whether you've got one of these or not. Um, once you've got an agency relationship, it's also important to understand what the consequences are. What does it mean for your relationship with, with each other and also with a third party? Because oftentimes agency law will involve some sort of a third party uh, participant. Um, there are a number of implications. You can take an entire class if you like in this area. Some of the most important ones though are that the agent can bind the principal to others in contract law. Again, think back to my Facebook example. This is why corporations often want to have agents is because those agents can enter into contracts on behalf of the corporation. Second consequence, the principal may be responsible for the torts of the agent or the legal wrongs of the agent. We saw an example of this already, right? With Gordon V. Doty. Ms. Doty was responsible for the bad actions of, um, of her agent, Coach Garst. Finally, the agent is going to owe fiduciary duties to the principal. So this is not just a, a normal relationship or a contractual relationship. It's a special relationship or a fiduciary relationship in the eyes of the law. And what that means is that the agent has to uh, be diligent. They have to be careful. They have to be loyal to the principal in the way that they carry out all of their various activities. Um, this is actually really important for corporate law and a lot of the obligations of corporate officers and, and board of directors and various folks within the corporate ecosystem flow from duties that were created initially in, in agency law. And again, that's why this is one of the main starting points for, for this area of legal studies. All right, I'm gonna skip over implication number one and not worry as much about contract law. And I wanna move into a couple more cases involving consequence number two, situations where the principal might be responsible for the torts or the legal wrongs of the agent. But first, let me give you just a little more law so that you can be an informed judge and jury. Um, we're going to be working with a theory called respondeat superior. There are a few different theories in this in this area, but but one of the big ones is known as respondeat superior. It basically means let the employer answer for the torts of the employee. And in order to have respondeat superior, there are two uh, additional requirements. First off, the agent has to be an employee and not just an independent contractor. In other words, it has to be a fairly close agency relationship, not a distant agency relationship. And second, the tort or the wrong has to be committed within the scope of employment. Now, the case we'll get to in a minute, we'll flesh what out, that out a little bit. Um, but in, in, in general, this has traditionally been understood as the problem arose out of a, a purpose to serve the employer. The, the, the agent was trying to serve the employer or carry out their agency responsibilities. And while doing so, they uh, incurred some sort of a legal wrong or they did, did, they did something problematic. Kind of a, a, a classic example that's given in, in, in some of the, uh, the legal books talking about the development of this doctrine is um, you've got a, a, a gardener that's working uh, in your home as an employee. And, um, you know, there's uh, some people that are trespassing on, on, your, uh, on your flower bed and the gardener you know, picks up a stick and throws the stick at, at the trespassers, you might be responsible for that um, under this do doctrine of respondeat superior. The tort was committed within the scope of employment because they were trying to protect your garden and, and, and get rid of the, the, the interlopers. Um, I'll say a little bit more about uh, the first element. So we need an employee relationship, not an independent contractor relationship. And um, I won't go through everything here. Here are some factors I'll just put up there so you can kind of see the various factors that are often important when we're making this distinction. 
Um, so this may be familiar uh, to some of you already at, at, at some level, right? I mean, you, you might already be aware of the difference between an employee and more of an independent contractor. Um, employee relationships are going to be subject to greater control by the principal, by, by, by the supervisor. Um, if you want a mental model for the difference here, you might think about, you know, coming back to the gardener example, two different types of gardeners. On the one hand, we might imagine a gardener that comes by every couple of weeks, mows and goes. That's more likely to be an independent contractor. They're bringing all their own equipment. They're not really, you know, following careful control or 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 um, or, or really, um, you know, super being supervised by by the, the homeowner. On the other hand, we might think of a gardener on, you know, some show like Downton Abbey or, or you know, one of those royalty shows that lives in a shed in the back of of, of the property. All the equipment is owned by the homeowner. Every morning they get up and they say, well, what do you want me to do today? Should I you know, prune the roses? Should I cut the hedges? Well, why don't you cut the hedges today? That's more like a, an employee type relationship, uh, a closer agency relationship. All right, now we're ready to take on um, our next case and apply this doctrine of respondeat superior um, to the Ira Bushy versus US case. Um, this is the one that I handed out. So some of you might have had an opportunity to read it, but even if you haven't had a chance to read the case yet, I think um, we can summarize it pretty quickly in a way that will allow you to, to hopefully um, um, follow along. Um, I guess at the outset, we really should acknowledge that some of the terminology and especially some of the um, language related to, 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 to gender is a little bit outdated. I mean, this is a you know 50 year old case and some of the terminology of the court hasn't aged very well. Nowadays, we wouldn't be talking about um, you know, reasonable men or working men. We'd be talking about reasonable people. Um, but I do think it's a, a notable case. It, it's notable for the facts that it sets up. It's notable for its approach to the law. Um, it's also notable at some level for, um, for its jurisprudential development, for the way that it um, makes changes to the law and talks about how the law should necessarily evolve through common law reasoning. So um, I think this case um, um, has a lot going for it, even if, if, if um, I, I wish the terminology was, was a little more updated. Um, let me talk quickly about what's going on. And then again, I'm going to invite some of you to help decide um, whether or not this case was, was, was properly, um, properly adjudicated. So here's the basic story. There was a, a Coast Guard ship that uh, had been brought into Brooklyn and it was sitting in dry dock getting retrofitted. Now, while the ship was getting retrofitted, the sailors were still living on the ship and they had set up some system where the sailors were going to be able to exit the ship and go off through the dry dock and uh, take shore leave while they were uh, repairing the ship. So the sailors were living on the ship during this maintenance period in the dry dock. One of the sailors uh, named Lane um, went off and took some shore leave and got drunk. Apparently, Lane got really, really drunk, came back to uh, the ship um, late at night, um, walked uh, you know, along the, the, the gangway where Lane was supposed to um, you know, go back to his bunk, and Lane decided to spin a set of valves in the dry dock um, 30 times, three valves, 30 times, and it turned out that those valves controlled the water intake to the dry dock. And shortly thereafter, the dry dock filled up with water, the ship toppled over, and the dry dock was damaged. Now, fortunately, no one was, was really hurt, but Ira Bushy, the dry dock owner, was, was notably upset, understandably upset. And Bushy said, well, I'd like someone to pay for this, this harm. Um, Lane had sort of disappeared. I don't think Lane had a lot of money to, to pay for this harm anyway. So instead, Bushy said, I'd like to try to recover for Lane's tort from the Coast Guard. And the legal theory uh, turned again on whether or not respondeat superior liability would attach to the Coast Guard. Should the Coast Guard answer for the torts or the wrongs of Lane? And again, there were two major issues to resolve under this respondeat superior liability standard. Um, was uh, Lane an employee or an independent contractor? And second, was Lane acting within the scope of his employment during this incident? Let me invite a few of you to, um, uh, to, to again, share your video, share your screen, 
and let's just see if we can talk this one through. So you know, go ahead and please uh, volunteer if, if you're interested in, in discussing the case and we can try to see what happened and see if the court actually got it right and, and, and talk a little bit more about why that might or might not be the case. All right, great. We've got one one volunteer and go ahead. If you're interested in participating, please, you know, don't hesitate. Jump in as well. Um, Vincent, welcome. Hi. Um, let me ask you first about element number one. Do you think that Lane was an employee or was an agency? Um, I think oh, sorry, an independent contractor. Um. I think Lane was sort of very clearly an employee, um, both based on, one, the government providing equipment, like Lane didn't bring his own boat um, to do coast guarding, um, to the fact that, um, judging by the term seaman, I'm assuming he was enlisted in the Coast Guard, which is, was. again, a far more in the scope of employment than independent contracting. All right. So in your view, it looked like he was more of an employee, less of an independent contractor. So Vincent, I, I think I'm with you. I mean, my guess is that this is sort of the perfect example of an employee type relationship. I'll bet that Lane didn't feel like he had a lot of responsibility every day and deciding whether or not he was going to work on this part of the ship or that part of the ship. He was probably being directed very much uh, what, what to do and told what to do. So the next question, I suppose, is um, whether or not this wrong occurred in the scope of employment, was related to the employment of, of, of Lane. Before I ask you, Vincent, for your thoughts, let me ask, uh, again, those of you in the chat to, to give us a quick vote. Within the scope of employment, yes or no? What do you think? Is this activity within the scope of employment? All right, I'm seeing some pretty split opinions. I'm seeing some yeses, I'm seeing some noes. Again, those of you that just voted in the chat, if you wanna come in video, you know, please don't hesitate. It'd be great to have you as well. But Vincent, since you're here, let me ask for your opinion. Um, was Lane acting within the scope of employment during this incident? I would argue yes, um, for a few reasons. Um, the first is in, like in his role as a Coast Guardsman, um, there is no like defined off period when you're on a boat. So like you can not have any listed responsibilities, but you still have responsibilities if the ship starts to sink or gets shot at. Um, so one, like there are no off hours. Um, two, it, um, sort of the the job of maintaining a boat while in dry dock um, involves, you know, turning valves, moving things, cleaning things. Um, and even though he was obviously drunk and made an error of judgment um, in turning the um, valves, that is still a thing that reasonably he would have done well not he would have done at that time while sober but he would have done similar similar mechanical activities on and around the boat while sober so do you think that when lane was coming back from shore leave um he was thinking all right what i really need to do now before i go to bed is to help out my employer make sure that the coast guard you know has things go properly with their ship and the right way for me to do that is to spin these these, these three valves 30 times. In other words, was he attempting to um, to serve the the employer? Um, I would argue yes. Um, although he clearly did not by <laughs> doing it, but I think that was his mind. It's a little hard to know what he was thinking, right? I'm not sure that he even knew what he yeah. was thinking. But um, it, it, it does... It does relate a little bit, I guess, to what we might think his obligations were. I don't know, again, if he was the one turning valves or if, you know, the valves were more the responsibility of the dry dock. But it's not um, impossible to imagine that uh, sailors would sometimes in the course of their duty be, be turning various valves. Now, the court actually didn't use 
this purpose to serve test, right? It, it, it recognized that there was this test that was commonly used to determine if something had happened within the scope of employment, but it didn't use this purpose to serve test. Instead, it used an alternative test known as foreseeability. Was it foreseeable that something like this would happen? And, and you know, we get a quote, you know, in the second part of the opinion, it says, here it was foreseeable the crew members crossing the dry dock might do damage. Vincent, is it foreseeable that something like this would ever happen? Um, I would say yes. Um, given that dry dock incidents happen how many all the time. How many times do you um, think this has happened before and since? I know Russia messed up its aircraft carrier because it sunk a floating right. dry dock because a sailor lit something on All fire right. so, accidentally. So maybe it occurs from time to time. I'm not sure that prior to being aware of this case, I would have thought that it was foreseeable that we would have expected, you know, this sort of thing to happen. But the judge actually goes back a little bit, doesn't he, in the level of abstraction and say, it might not be foreseeable that this specific thing would happen, but it's foreseeable that some problem like this could could thereby occur. And so I think that's what's in part motivating uh, motivating the judge. All right, let me let me let you off the hook for a minute. Thanks very much for your participation. Um, one of the other important questions, I think, um, relating to this case. so so the court, of course, at the end of the day said, um, yes, actually, I do think that the um, government's going to be responsible. The Coast Guard is going to be responsible. They're going to be liable for um, for the problems here. And um, the theory that uh, Judge Friendly used was a little bit different, right, than the traditional theory, as we just said. Um, one of the other things I think that's important for the case and that's motivating um, the outcome of the case relates to the policy implications of the case. So I want to ask, again, if there's any volunteers, that, that'd be great. If, if anyone wants to just comment on the chat, that's fine as well. Um, what do we think the results of this decision are going to be on actors going forward in other words do we expect that parties are going to modify their behavior modify the way that they you know um carry out their activities in response to the imposition of liability in 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 this case and if anything what does that say about whether this case was was properly decided i mean do we think that this result leads to the right incentives for society or do we feel like you know maybe an alternative result would would be better and we want to share their thoughts on that question great Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Is it Kelsey? Yeah, perfect. Welcome. Um, I would say in the long run, this places the burden on safety towards the employers. Okay. It makes more sense because then the employer obviously has more money, typically I would think, like a corporation than like an individual person. And ultimately, I think that would be better for public policy. Okay. So one of the things we might like to have happen is to put incentives in place that are going to reduce the possibility that an accident like this happens right in the in the future now it may not be this exact accident but something something similar so i think um that's a, a great avenue of, of discussion i guess i'd ask you question one um is there anything that the coast guard could have done to have prevented this sort of problem from occurring i guess they could have hired or been more choosy when it comes to hiring people because it's yeah. like <laughs> Yeah, it's people like people like Lane. Yeah, okay. maybe maybe more careful with who it is that you choose to hire. Um, yes. You know, Seaman Lane might not have been the best person to, to 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 bring on. Anything else you can think of that they could have done? Well, I I know they could have instituted instituted better policies within for their employees because I remember I took like a bartending class um, once. And I'm pretty sure there's like an agency kind of requirement there where a bartender or like the employer of the bartender is responsible if they, if, a, if a bartender gives too much alcohol to one person and the person drives off and gets into the accident. Um, because of that, bartenders are held um, to super high standards and they try not. That's why a lot of bartenders won't give extra alcohol to someone who's in, extremely inebriated. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, maybe we could have better training right or be better controls over what it is that they're doing i'm seeing a couple of helpful comments in the chat you know uh kaylin says why don't we just discourage drinking right even on shore leave right we can have a greater level of punishment by the coast guard that might discourage this behavior from 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 taking place or michael says look why don't we try to figure out a way to you know acknowledge that 
he had a problem coming into the ship. There was a, a guard there. And if you see someone like this, train the other sailors to escort him over to his bunk so that he doesn't do something stupid on the way through. Um, Kelsey, one other consideration we should ask, however, is whether or not there's anything Ira Bushy might have been able to do to prevent this problem from occurring. Because if Ira Bushy is the party that could conceivably take the easier precautions, maybe they should be the one that should be um, responsible for the damages and we'll give them incentives to, to do better next time around. Well, I'm not sure what to say because they hired the U.S. government for to handle their ship. And I don't know anyone who who would be like or the Coast Guard. Um, I don't know who would be more reliable to handle ships than um, the Coast Guard. OK, so you'd say, well, the Coast Guard was in. Now, the, the, the dry dock owner, though, controlled the property around the dry dock, including the valves that the seamen turned. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Abby's got an idea. Abby says, why don't we put locks on the valves, right? Um, who's in a better position to put locks on valves? The dry dock owner who owns the valves or, you know, or, or the Coast Guard. And so there's, I think, a little bit of an argument that might say, well, do we really want a test this broad? Um, because maybe it means that then Ira Bushy and the various dry dock owners of the world might not take precautions that they would otherwise be interested in taking in order to, to minimize the damages. Now, um, the judge actually has a pretty interesting uh, footnote in this case that says, um, you know what, it may be, even if the case comes out the way that it does, um, the Coast Guard would encourage dry dock owners to take put locks on the dry on the dry dock valves because they know that they're going to be responsible under, under under the outcome of this case so um it's a little bit of a, an interesting question and i think it comes down to what's going to be the easier and more likely result that's going to lead to that um, but at the end of the day the court here kel saying thank you i'll let you go at the end of the day the court here says um we are going to hold the um uh the coast guard responsible um it's interesting uh i guess also to note uh how the two courts, the lower court and the um, appellate court, differed in the result that they reached. Because they, they, they both agreed that the Coast Guard should be responsible, but from a jurisprudential manner, they did it in a slightly different way. And I just want to kind of call your attention to that in the case. Um, in the uh, lower court opinion, the, the, the trial court said, um, I am going to totally reconsider the policy behind this rule, and I don't think the policy makes much sense anymore, and therefore we're going to jettison the rule and hold employers responsible. They've got perhaps deeper pockets. They're going to be you know, on the hook for, for these types of problems. And the appellate court judge friendly said, can't do that. We've got to follow precedent. There's some precedent here limiting the liability of principles under these types of situations. But Friendly then went on to adopt a slightly different test. I think Friendly felt like it wasn't going to be very easy to say Lane had a purpose to serve, was trying to serve the employer during the, the valve turning. So Friendly changed the test. He said it's foreseeable, and he took a sort of a broadly, broadly approach, a broad approach to the foreseeability test, and basically reached the same outcome by changing the legal standard that was going to be used in a way that wasn't entirely inconsistent with precedent. It was just much more of a, um, a, a secondary or a lesser used approach to evaluating this scope of employment. OK, we've got a few minutes left. I want to ask one other question. Um, just because the case came out this way doesn't necessarily mean the law is right. So we have a standard that says under certain circumstances, um, you might be legally responsible for the acts of your agent. But it doesn't mean that the law has to be that way. And a lot of what you'll do in law school is try to evaluate the law once you've sort of figured out what it currently is. So I want to just sort of explore whether or not it's possible that the law in this specific area might be wrong. And, you know, I'm, we might take it on this way. Let's imagine that I own a fireworks store. I'm, you know, I, I own a chain of Geis's fireworks. And um, there are three possible legal regimes, or three possible worlds that we could live in. Here's world number one. We have a world where the principal is never liable for the torts of her agent. 
the principal is never going to be liable for the torts of the agent. If the agent commits a tort, let the to let the agent pay for the damage, but the principal is never going to be liable. So in the fireworks context, I'm never going to be liable for any torts of the employees within my fireworks empire. Let me invite anybody who wants to comment on whether they'd like to live in that world or not to go ahead and, and, and pop up on the screen or to, to share your audio and video. Is this a world you'd like to live in where the principal is never liable for the torts of her agent? How is that going to incentivize me to behave? How is that going to incentivize you know, the, the store to behave? Any thoughts or comments? Hi. Yeah. Hi. I welcome. I think that um, for an employee standpoint, it would be a very bad world to live in because I think people would be less likely to take jobs with more risks if they feel like they're going to be liable. Okay. And um, it's going to be hard for employees lower down to be able to pay for whatever damages might happen. So I think it's not, it doesn't fully make sense because if something does happen and the employees are liable and they don't have the funds to pay, then like what happens? So there are at least two different parties that might be affected, right? maybe three if you consider my incentives. Um, from the employee standpoint, uh, I'm not sure it's going to make a huge difference, right? Because if the employee does something stupid, they're going to be liable anyway under our current regime, right? I mean, so either way, I think the employee is going to be responsible. M maybe, um, you know, it, it might be a matter of, of, of is there going to be enough to recover? Let me ask it this way. Um, would you like to shop in a store like this under a world where the principal is never liable for the torts of her agent? No, because you can't be insured um, that you're going to be reimbursed. You might, like you might worry about the possibility of um, getting reimbursed if something really bad happens because maybe the employees aren't going to have deep enough pockets. That's, that's possible. You might also worry about the rules that I'm going to put in place in a system like this. Go ahead. Smoke on the job if you want. Right? <laughs> Who needs fire extinguishers? <laughs> it's never going to come back to haunt me. And you know, in, in a world like that, I, I do think that we might not feel that there are going to be great incentives in place. Kaylin, what about this world? Um, the principal is always liable for torts committed by her agent, no matter what. Any tort that an agent ever does, once you have an agency relationship, you're going to be responsible for it. Is that a good legal rule? I think it can cause issues in the sense that there will be less incentives to like grow your company um, and to be efficient and there might be too many rules and regulations put in place, but like that's not necessarily always a bad thing either. Yeah, I might worry a little bit about that. I mean, if we want to um, promote expansion of, of at least some commercial endeavors and, and to sort of help grow the economy, a, a rule like that might make um, some of us a little nervous, right? Because um, just because you happen to hire an employee, um, it's not obvious, right? Or it might make you nervous if everything they ever do down the road is going to be something that you might um, then be responsible for yourself. So, you know, the law attempts to sort of uh, impose this, this middle ground. We're going to try to set up a, a general compromise. The principal is going to be liable for torts of the employees, but only if they're acting within the scope of the duty and, and, and the, uh, you know, uh, if they're acting within their agency relationship, trying to either fulfill the purpose of their, their role or to serve the employer, or maybe if their, you know, their, their bad behavior was foreseeable. But the goal, of course, is to say, we want to try to hold employers, principals accountable for some of the wrongs that happen in relationship to, um, to, to, to the, the business endeavor, but not everything so that they won't be chilled from, in certain circumstances, um, uh, hiring, hiring various types of, um, of employees to try to, to try to grow their endeavor. I'll let you go. Thank you. So at the end of the day, I think what we can say is that um, legal treatment in this area turns on some real subtle distinctions. I mean, think about the various elements we've talked about, both to establish an agency relationship and also to establish liability for the principal in, in a respondeat superior case. These subtle distinctions might seem funny to you now. Why, why should they matter? And these are the types of things that can drive non-lawyers crazy, right? We're trying to, to draw some lines between one type of legal treatment and another. But it matters. And this, in part, is how you're going to be spending uh, much of your next year in law school, learning about what really matters, and then arguing whether or not it should. That's a second important part of, of, 
of, of your legal education because the law is not static. We see in the Ira Bushy case that it's changed. And a lot of what you're going to be doing is not only understanding what the law currently is, but having a robust discussion about whether it's um, uh, optimized or whether we should consider making some changes along the lines of what we've just done with this fireworks store regime. All right, well, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for uh, joining uh, me today. And I really hope that I'll see you here in the fall. I can't wait to get back in the classroom and I hope to see many of you uh, in person in the fall. Um, I'll go ahead and stick around for a few minutes in case you have any questions about these cases or these classes. Um, otherwise, thanks again for joining. I'll let you go and be sure to join our next session coming up at about 1130. Thanks everyone.